everybody. Welcome to Science Division Live. My name is Erin Baxter. I'm curator of anthropology, and I am going to do a brief presentation about dogs in, in lieu of our in ahead of our upcoming new exhibit on dogs. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, if you guys have questions, please say hi in the comments, and we'll get to your questions at the end. Um, and with that, away we go. Um, let me just share my screen, and we're off. So this is going to be about old dogs and new tricks, ancient dogs and the archaeological record. And most of you probably know a lot more about dogs than I do, but just as a brief overview, you know that most dogs, all dogs, have derived from wolves, basically wolves that um, originated in, uh, in the old world and in the new world as well. And from somehow, from wolves in the last 30,000 years or so, we have achieved all of these breeds that you see on the right. And the question is, is how did that really come to be? How do we get from an ancient wolf to a modern teacup poodle? And it's one question that archeologists are helping to answer. Um, so we know that ancient undomesticated, often very large dogs roamed six out of the seven continents. They didn't quite understand all of these breeds. This is showing the Pleistocene during the ice age. So the world is very cold and in this case blue and big dogs hunted big, big dog animals. Um, this is when megafauna were going on. So they hunted in packs, they had teeth, they cooperated. And this is across the six continents in the world. And then as things warmed up and megafauna died off, um, dog behavior, um, like the dire wolf and the like, it changed. They either died off with it or they adapted, as animals are wont to do. Um, so they began to get smaller and the like. And these are dogs basically over in Asia. And they, um, they actually sort of domesticated themselves. They got smaller, faster, thinner, lighter to go after smaller, faster game. And they realized that they'd been competing with humans up until now, and they stopped doing that or at least they stopped doing it a little bit. And some sort of came into where the, the fireplaces were and took the scraps from humans and the like. And the thinking was, is that they domesticated themselves more, more so than humans domesticated them. Um, but we all know the meme, you know, <laughs> what happens? Maybe I'll get some food at the campfire and then holy smokes, what happens later? I had to get a meme in, I'm sorry, I don't know why. Um, but yeah, so as things warmed up, again, and, and, the, and the megafauna died off, humans began to move as well. And they took their new dog friends with them, often to what's known as the New World, the Americas, North, South, Central America, and um, over even sometimes into Antarctica. And they took them at these tamer, smaller, and then began to selectively breed them for particular things. And we'd see depictions in the archeological record of these new and interesting kind of dogs that were once wolves a few thousand years before, but were now all sorts of different animals that were selected in different regions for different tasks. And, um, and they also became companions. I love this sort of quote here from a Roman from the first century BCE. Um, the dogs became so close that they became family-like and that they received names and um, burials and epitaphs and tombstones. Some wore um, jewelry that is nicer than anything I assure you any of us own. Um, and they were sort of all over the, you know, recognized all over the place. Um, and then here's another sort of shorter and to the point. Maya never barked without reason and now is silent, which is poignant and, and telling and kind of extraordinary for how Romans treated their dogs. Not all Romans everywhere did treat their dogs that well. This wasn't to say that all dogs were treated as companions early on. Some were discarded, some were sacrificed um, and, and the like. So, um, there, but the earliest burials weren't even close to the Romans. The earliest burials of dogs and humans were 14,000 years ago. So just a few thousand years after domestication. And then that practice continued up and through the Neolithic um, and into the Roman period and into, even into now. You all know we have pet cemeteries even in Denver. Um, but in other parts of the Roman Empire, dogs were discarded, they were buried under roads, thrown out and the like. So we see differential behaviors towards dogs um, just like we do everywhere else. Um, I got ahead of myself. So we, if we go over to sort of North America to this sort of continual purposeful breeding, dogs were picked because they were, they were protectors, they could be retrievers, they could be household pets, they could be herders, they were used for their fur, for companionship, and even chihuahuas were used as basically hot water bottles. They, thought, well, they were thought to be medicinal, and you just put a chihuahua on your head if you had a headache. Um, and again, this led to multitude of, of breeds, behaviors, size, and aggression. And here's the phenotype of a wolf versus a chihuahua in the Americas, and how different and how very sort of phenotypically and genotypically different 
dogs became today. And this is a dog, a type of dog that we no longer see that's in North America that um, is extinct. And this, I will get back to this in a second, but basically there were lots of changes in how this came to be. Um, dogs in North America were selected for their fur, their uh, strength as pack animals, and their, sometimes their ability to provide meat. So they were eaten in parts of North and Central and South America, as well as for companionship and protection. Um, and we know this too from historic paintings of uh, European explorers who came into contact with these indigenous groups. Um, and we see what, uh, what they saw. Uh, for instance, here is a, a Salish wool dog who were bred for their fi fine and fluffy fur. And there is a woman who is actually making a rug with that dog's fur. They were shorn sort of early on. Um, Earl Morris from the University of Colorado Boulder um, found this dog fur sash uh, in Obelisk Cave in Arizona. And this is a really, really fine example of incredibly fine fur and incredibly um, well-crafted sorts of objects that are just right here in the state with us. And white dogs seem to be the preferred dog um, in North America as well. Um, dogs often lived in villages to protect people um, and warn humans of animal or human attackers. Um, and they were pack animals too, who carried gear and supplies across the America. More so in the plains than the US Southwest, um, but sort of Denver's on the border of both of those. So dogs would have had dual roles. Um, again, they were sometimes buried in the plains and in the Southwest and sometimes not. And we see historic photographs. This is a tradition that continued up until the 19th and 20th century, um, where dogs were used as beasts of burden uh, because there weren't other sort of, they were the biggest domesticated animal in the new world. Um, and when sort of horses took over this phenomenon um, and, and dogs were no longer needed to sort of uh, bear, um, bear pack animal sort of status, um, they still remained as companions, which I think is kind of cute. Uh, and lovely. And this is a phenomenon that was often remarked upon by Europeans who came into contact with indigenous people. Um, here's a, a, a soldier who's commenting about a, a, a group of Apache people coming through and um, they talked about the characteristics of the Pueblo, the Arica, Arikara, and here the Apache and how, how varied and, and how well they treated their dogs. Um, up to and including saving them from bears and the like. And there's an example from the Lewis and Clark expedition uh, of dogs saving the life of many of the of the people. Um, but not all American dogs were bred, Leslie, to sort of be beasts of burden and attack bears. Some short-haired small dogs in sort of warmer climes were bred for food, like we said. Um, and um, it's, and this is a, I, I, I don't know if you've ever had dog that kind of tastes like chicken, uh, for those of you who have, have had, um, but they were also, again, valued for medicinal purposes as well. Um, but what archaeology is kind of here is a chance to, for archaeologists to sort of flesh out where, what we learn from dogs and artifacts and mummies and excavations and things that we find in the archeological rec record is really telling us about um, things that we didn't know about dogs before. Um, and one of the most sort of exciting things is genetics, um, but it's also telling us about when we don't have the records, historical records, um, what humans and what their relationship with dogs was like. So in ancient Central America, hairless chihuahua were models for their water vessels and canteens, which you're seeing on the right. And Denver Museum has a few of these, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can see that the artist took some extraordinary creative license um, in the animal shape because of the functionality of the vessel, but also in general in its cuteness. I think the ceramic is much more lovable, but that's maybe just me. We also find archaeologists in the, in the record um, find evidence of caretaking for dogs. So here's a dog that's suffered from valley fever and it was cared for, um, even though it couldn't probably feed itself or hunt procure its own food. It was cared for by ancient humans, which is extraordinary. And depictions closer to home in, um, in around the Four Corners, you see dog canteens um, and effigy vessels and things that were likely ceremonial and as well as functional in the archaeological record, um, which is pretty great. So dogs appear in secular and non-secular kind of um, context. And indigenous dogs were hunters as well as companions. Um, and we see these, for example, in Mimbres Volts of southern New Mexico. And I think everyone has experienced uh, the uh, dogs jumping up and licking you on the left, which I think is extraordinary for a 900-year-old vessel. Um, we also find ritual sort of offerings. Archaeologists joke that we, when we don't know the function, we, we call it ritual. These may have been toys. We're not really sure from Pueblo Grande in Arizona. But often we think that the rituals, they may be found in ritual context or the like.
in my own research, I look at Aztec uh, ruins in New Mexico, which is just on the border of Colorado. It was dug up by Oral Morris in the, uh, the early 1900s. He taught at CU Boulder. And here he, he's excavated a kiva or a round ceremonial chamber. And there in the corner, you can see, is the remains of a wolf. Um, which is extraordinary. So we don't know, it raises questions about wolves in domestic context, but sort of these sorts of things, archeologists are able to contribute ideas about possible organization, political organization, who had power and authority to go out and get a wolf buried in a ceremonial place, and maybe even the role of witchcraft in ancient society. But by far and away, the most interesting things that archeologists are contributing is finding specimens that geneticists can then go on and talk to us about speciation, breeding, and how humans interact with dogs. And one of the most recent findings is that we know that 99% of indigenous dogs in the Americas are now extinct. So even um, when we see sort of uh, uh, you know, dogs, like little small dogs that we think are maybe local dogs, they've been, over, they've been swamped by genetic material from European and particularly Asian dogs. Uh, the only remaining indigenous dogs, this is less than 1%, are Malamutes, hairless South American variety of Chihuahua hmm. and uh, some feral Carolina dogs. And hmm. probably it was due to disease and European biases and selection that made these dogs disappear. And it's these sort of pressures that also parallel what happened to indigenous cultures in the world, um, in, the, in the New World, in the in Americas when, they were co when it was colonized. So archeology span is really cool to, to sort of find this and so make these sort of supporting re really global sort of um, assertions about the ancient past, thanks to dogs data. And here's just a nice photo of a dog that was taken in 1995. This is Bob and his, um, and his critters. And with that, that's all I wanted to say about dogs. If you guys have questions, I would love to take them. Hi, Erin. There we go. Okay. And I am here. Hi, everybody. I'm Memory Williams. I'm just popping in to share any of your questions with Aaron. And Aaron, it's not looking like we have too many questions right now, right? So, <laughs> but I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I wonder what's your favorite breed of dogs, and do you have any dogs? I, I used to, I grew up with a dog. His name was Willie Nelson Dog. Willie Nelson because he would Dog, howl perfect. At Nelson, yeah, Dog. And uh, he would howl at Willie Nelson music, and he was the golden retriever, but he was not well trained, so he was a golden retainer. That was <laughs> love my favorite. It, love <laughs> it. But, uh, and I don't have any dogs because archaeologists make, well, for, I make a terrible dog mother because we go off into the field of your dog. Yeah, that's it's very sad for both yeah. Either that or a uh, really long uh, stay with a friend. But right. yeah, I am not seeing any questions right now. So All right. if you want to sign us out, we can we can get 